And that takes us to the problem of vanishing and exploding gradients. Okay, so we want to see what is the problem with this back propagation through time, which could lead to certain uh, interesting situations. So we'll focus on this do st by sk, and let me just go back. So remember that this formula had this do st by sk, right? Where st could be the last time step, and sk could also be the first time step because you are summing over all the time steps, right? So you could have a term which is st. T capital T which is the last time step, the first time step and the derivative of the last time step with respect to the first time step. Right? So, that is the situation that we are dealing with. So, we will consider one such generic element which is dou st by dou sk and we will just try to expand it. So, remember I had done this short circuiting. So, I am now just going to expand it again. So, this is going to be t by t minus 1, t minus 1 by t minus 2 and so on up to k plus 1 by sk okay? and I can write it as this generic formula. Everyone fine with this? I have just replaced this as a product and written it more compactly. Now, let us look at one such term here, do sj plus 1 by do sj. Now, just to confuse you guys, from next slide I will go over to do sj by do sj minus 1. Now, not to confuse you, I just did not pay attention to this. So, instead of s plus 1 and j, I am going to do j and j minus 1, right? it remains the same, does not matter. So, we are interested in this particular quantity. So, let us see what this derivative is, and remember that. In the final formula, we have a product of these quantities. So, I am looking at one such term in my final product. So, just to jog your memory, A j is the pre activation which is given by this, and then S j is the hidden representation after activation after the nonlinearity which is given by. So, let me just uh, uh, write it down as S j by S j minus 1 can be written as this chain rule, which is first compute S j with respect to A j and then a j with respect to s j minus 1. Everyone is fine that so far at this point, please raise your hands if you are fine. Okay. Now, let me just write down a j and s j explicitly. So, remember that a j is this uh, d dimensional vector, which has entries a j 1, a j 2 up to a j d and s j is the corresponding activation applied vector, which has these entries sigma a j 1, a j 2 and so on. Okay. Now, first question what is this quantity? Scalar, vector, matrix, tensor. Numerator is a, denominator is a, so that is why it is a matrix. Okay. So, that is the matrix that I am interested in. If I can give you that matrix, then we are kind of done. So, to help me filling in this matrix, tell me what this matrix is going to look like even before we start filling it. Okay. You are right, but it does not matter because you will have u x and then you are taking the derivative with respect to s j minus 1, right? so this does not matter. Okay. So, everyone gets that? You will have a u x j here, right? but that does not matter because you are taking a derivative with respect to s j, so that is a constant. So, do s j by do a j is what? What does this matrix look like? How many of you say a diagonal matrix? Okay, good. So, it is straightforward. Right? What is the first entry? It is going to be do s 1 by, sorry, do s j 1 by do a j 1 what is that going to be? It will be something, but let us look at the second entry do s j 2 by a j 1, what is this going to be? What is this going to be? 0, because it does not depend on that. right? So, now you can see how the full matrix will look like, all the off diagonal elements are going to be zeros and the diagonal elements are going to be sigma primes. Everyone fine with this? Okay. So, this matrix I am going to just call it as diagonal sigma prime a j. This is a diagonal matrix which I have. And what is dou a j by dou s j minus 1? Scalar vector matrix, scalar matrix, which matrix? W. Okay. So, now for some reason I am interested in the magnitude of this. Why am I interested in the magnitude of this? For some reason I am interested. Okay. Let us see y will become clear, but for some reason I am interested in and here is I will write how I will write the magnitude of this. Okay. So, this is the norm that I am interested in. So, I have already said that this is actually equal to whatever is inside this norm. So, I can just write it as this norm. So, I have norm of c is equal to norm of a b which is less than equal to norm a norm b. 
okay this is fine okay now let's look at the norm of this now i'm going to say that sigma aj is actually a bounded function because we are using sigmoid or tan h or something so it's a bounded function okay so that means sigma dash aj is also going to be bounded actually can you tell me what's the bound for the logistic function for sigma dash aj if sigma is logistic function what sigma dash what's the bound for sigma dash if i say 1 by 4 how many of you will agree with that how many of you have a problem with that if you don't understand this you will not understand anything after that okay still don't have a problem so for the logistic function the bound is actually 1 by 4 the maximum derivative that you can get if you have this curve yeah so then that would be 1 by 4 okay what about the tan h function and that actually happens at this point right point 0.5 so point 0.5 into point 0.5 is 1 by 4 what about the tan h function the bound is 1 right so this is this clearly an upper bound on these things the derivative is going to be an upper bounded thing that means this magnitude is actually going to be upper bounded by something and i'll just call it as lambda oh sorry as gamma so this quantity is bounded and i'm going to call that bound as gamma what about our weight matrix it's again bounded right we have real weights we don't have like blowing we don't have uh, very large weights it's all bounded so it's still going to be some upper bound on this and i'll call this magnitude as gamma right so this quantity on the left hand side I can say that it is less than equal to some gamma into lambda. Now let us look at the product. So this is the quantity that I was interested in and this is actually a product of various such quantities. So what is it going to be now okay can you go to the next step it will be gamma into lambda raised to t minus t minus k right t minus it basically has t minus this product has t minus k terms right so it will be gamma lambda raised to t minus k now if gamma or lambda so or rather gamma into lambda if it's greater than 1 what will happen what will happen to this series explode if it's less than 1 it will vanish right so you get that so that's why you have this vanishing and exploding gradients problem okay but why what if this vanishes what vanishes let's go back so I have shown you that this quantity could vanish right if this vanishes the entire gradient could vanish and if the gradient vanishes what would happen no updates and you are just stuck where you are if the gradient explodes what happens think in terms of the WB plane you suddenly have a very large gradient what will happen it just gone way far from where you are right now because your update is W is equal to W minus eta into this gradient and this you have got a very large value now it's just going to move somewhere very far from where you are and that's never good right you have suddenly jumped to a different universe okay so that's the problem in training recurrent neural networks you could have this problem of exploding or vanishing gradients and we have done a mathematical derivation of why you have this problem okay so one trick to do that is to avoid this is remember these are t minus k terms and the problem appears when your t minus k is or rather your t is close to capital T and your k is close to 1 right in those cases you will have many terms in the product you will have as many as t terms in the product so even if your product is uh, even if this product is slightly less than 1 if you raise it to capital T it is going to vanish right so can you think of a solution for this and the last module in the title of this lecture was truncated back propagation so can you think of a solution for this so you don't back propagate through all the time steps just use an approximation that if you are at time step n you are just going to look at n minus k time steps and you are not going to look all the way back right so that is a common trick used to avoid uh, exploding and vanishing gradients what is the other thing that you could do to avoid exploding gradients so remember that you have some gradient right so think in terms of vectors you have some gradient vector w whose magnitude is very large what will you do to avoid exploding gradients in gradient descent you are always interested in the direction so what can I do just normalize it right so you could just do this so typically what is done is that you can instead of normalizing it you can just say that you will clip the gradient so that its magnitude is less than a certain k right so normalize it in such a way that its uh, grade its magnitude becomes k so this is something typical that you will see when you use tensor flow where it will have something which says clip the gradients to a certain magnitude 
and there are different ways of doing this right. So, I just give you an intuition the that this is what you use for magnitude, but there are other things that you can use for magnitude. So, just go back and look at that ok. So, that is a back propagation through time with exploding and vanishing gradients and then the solution for that or a hack for that is truncated back propagation ok. We have we are not yet done with this problem, we will again look at other solutions for handling this which will lead us to LSTMs which is long short term memory cells and gated recurrent units. So, that we will do in the next lecture.